Father's house. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for that truth, God. Lord, that you are for us and not against us, that um, we are who you say we are. Um, I just pray for Brandon this morning as he brings your word, Lord, that you would speak through him um, and just be in this service today. We love you so much. Pray this in your name, amen. How cool is that intro video? For real though. It's nice to come in and just like be pumped for a church when that service starts. I hear that like, boom, boom. I love it. You don't have to like it. I love it. Guys, my name is Brandon Stokes. I'm one of the pastors here at Story Hill, and I am so excited to be here to be sharing more of this story of Daniel. It is fantastically weird and wonderful and so different than so many other things that we encounter in scripture, but it is powerful. And and I'm I'm pumped to get into it this morning. Um, Last week, just a real quick recap. Last week, Daniel and his friends are captured and thrown into this foreign kingdom. And they they go to all of this training to try to see if they're valuable and worthy to the king for them to keep him. And Daniel and his friends stay obedient to God and they pass all the tests with flying colors, even doing it differently than what the king requests them to do. They stay obedient to God and they find favor with the king. They find themselves in the king's court as the uh, wise men among all of the wise men. But most importantly, what we see from last week is Daniel, because of his obedience and his relationship with God, he is finding favor with God. And that is a sweet place to be. And as we continue finding favor with God, amazing things continue to happen. So we pick up this week in Daniel chapter two, verse one, and we're gonna work our way through these verses and and unpack what it is that God is working in this story this morning. So starting in verse one, It says, in the second year of his reign, year one is marked by all of this capturing and and bringing in and cultivating and growing up his kingdom. In the second year of his reign, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream and it troubled him and sleep deserted him. So the king gave orders to summon the magicians, the mediums, the sorcerers, the Chaldeans, all of them to tell the king his dreams. And when they came and stood before the king, He said to them, I've had a dream and I'm anxious to understand it. Couple quick things to understand in this. These are all men that specialize in their particular area of interpreting dreams and signs. And they did it in all kinds of weird ways. Like some of the guys, their thing was to take like the liver of an animal and put it on a table. And depending on how it looked and like shook and smelled, I don't know. They interpreted what the future was based on that liver. Okay, kind of strange, like a lot strange. But each of them had their own way of whether it was by what the wind sounded like that day or what their own dreams were showing them. They each had their own specific way of how to interpret things. And they were all usually based on other religions and other gods out there in their culture that they worshiped. And so the king calls in the experts of interpreting dreams and visions from all of the different religions and all of the different places around the world and brings them in to his kingdom. And he says, I've had a dream, it's troubled me. The other thing about that language is that that word troubled uh, in the original language implies this like hammering, this constant nagging, hammering, keeping awake for him. And it's likely that this was not just a one-time thing, but this was a dream that was 
causing him constantly to lose sleep, to stay awake. I've had lots of different kinds of dreams. Anybody big dreamers out there? Who has like never had a dream, can't remember any dreams? A couple of you, yeah, that happens sometimes. I've had dreams of like being chased by dragons and, and fighting dragons. Uh, I've had dreams about um, uh, being chased by raptors. That's, that's for real. Uh, I've had dreams about uh, flying. Anybody fly out there in your dreams? That's pretty cool. That's, that's an awesome skill to have. Um, I've had the dream where you show up to school without your homework or your clothes. <laughs> Uh, You want to know what's worse than showing up to school without your clothes? Showing up to church without your clothes. And I have dreamed that as well. I've had nightmare, scary dreams that wake me up in a cold sweat that keep me awake long after the dream is over. And I think it's that last one that we kind of zero in on. It's that kind of dream that Nebuchadnezzar is waking up with just this terrified, uncertain, can't go back to sleep, heart racing kind of dreams. Dreams were a huge deal in this time. And just like all of these wise men of the court had been studying, dreams were used often in that time as an idea of interpreting the future. And so if someone had a dream, especially a bad dream, it was a huge deal. And if the king the ruler of all of the kingdom, all basically that was known, if he is having bad dreams, it could be a very bad deal. So it's something they would have taken very, very seriously. So we continue in verse four and it says, the Chaldeans spoke to the king as kind of the spokesperson of all the wise men and started off saying, may the king live forever. Tell your servants the dream and we will give the interpretation. And that sounds like a very normal way to start, right? King, we hear you, we're here. Your wise men have come. We have the answers. Tell us the dream and we will tell you what it means. And the king throws a crazy curveball. He replies to them, my word is final. If you don't tell me the dream and then tell me its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb and your houses will be made a garbage dump. That's when you realize how powerful King Nebuchadnezzar really is. He has a bad dream, he wakes up grumpy and starts to murder people. And no one is like, you can't do that. That's the kind of power we're talking about with this king. That's the authority that this guy has. And and the men are terrified. So the king has given them this impossible task. He said, normally you interpret my dreams, but this one has scared me in a different way than the others have, and I'm taking it to a whole new level. If you can't tell me what the dream is and then interpret it for me, I'm gonna destroy your lives and everything that comes with it. But the king also says, if you can tell me what the dream is and interpret it correctly, I will bless your household beyond your wildest dreams, power and wealth beyond your greatest imagination. So the Chaldeans think about this and they wrestle with it with one another and they come back before the king crying out saying, king, no one on earth can make known what the king requests. Consequently, no king, however great and powerful, has ever asked anything like this of any magician, of any medium or Chaldean. What the king is asking is so difficult that no one can make it known to him except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. These men come forward and they go, listen, all of these gods that we pray to on a regular basis, all the ones that we seek our power from, they are silent on this matter because they're the only ones that could answer it and none of them are here with us. And at that, the king becomes furious because listen, this, all of these wise men that he has surrounded himself with do not have the power that they claim to have. Because for their whole reign with him, they have said, listen, King, we can tell you, we have the wisdom, we have the knowledge, we can interpret your greatest fears. We can lead you the way that you need to be led. And in this moment at the King's greatest need of of being confused and and, uh, torn with this dream, these men go, listen, not only do we not have the power, none of our gods are willing to help with this either. And so in his fury, the king sends his guards out and he goes, gather up all of the wise men and we're gonna put them to death because they're frauds, they're liars. 
They have faked this power that they claim to have. And so I don't need them anymore. Let's get rid of them all. Who do we know in this story that just recently became a wise man? Daniel, the name of the book, in case we forgot. It's a big deal. Daniel's not even there. He's not even in this conversation. Daniel is far off somewhere handling his own responsibilities in his life. And in that moment, one of the king's captains comes up to Daniel and goes, hey, uh, so news from the kingdom, uh, you're gonna die now. So be ready for that. Come on with us and let's head back to the kingdom, to the king's palace. What crazy news to receive. Put yourself in that situation. If you're going about your own business and your boss comes in and goes, not only are you fired, And Daniel responds in the craziest way. In verse 14, it says, then Daniel responded with tact and discretion. The captain of the king's guard, to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to execute the wise men of Babylon. Guys, that's one of the first important things we need to take away with this is just kind of a side note as we're reading through this passage. When Daniel is confronted with life-changing, confrontational, aggressive, attacking news, He doesn't respond in anger. He doesn't respond in fear and trembling or complaining or griping. What does it say? He responds with tact and discretion. And I don't need to explain all the ways that the world is crazy right now, but this is a reminder for us as believers as we are trying to be obedient to what God has called us to, that when we are confronted with crazy, hard, difficult things, our calling is to respond with tact with discretion, other words and translations are understanding, knowledge, wisdom. But if you're like me, that can be a really difficult thing to do, am I right? We're front, confronted with all kinds of things every day that I sit home with Hannah and I go, I don't even know how to respond to that. I don't even have words to put to this thing that is happening right now. But God says the man who's modeling God's character responds to those situations with tact, wisdom, discretion, counsel, prudence. Let's continue. Verse 15, Daniel, in his responding that way, simply asks Arioch, why is this decree from the king so harsh? Then Arioch explains the whole situation to Daniel of how all of the wise men were brought before the king and he has brought them out as frauds as powerless frauds who who are trying to worship gods that aren't listening. So Daniel then says he went before the king and he asked the king to give him some time so that he could give the king the interpretation. Here's another cool thing to take away real quick. Daniel goes before the king and asks for time. Give me some time, let me figure this out. I will come back with an interpretation. That's exactly what a few verses ago, all the wise men stood before the king and goes, we can't do this, give us more time. And in this passage, the king responds, like quit stalling. I'm not giving you any more time. You have the power or you do not. But here it says, as Daniel asks for the king's time, the king responds and says, okay, go take your time, go figure this out, get back to me in the morning. Why? Why all of a sudden has the king shown a different kind of favor with Daniel than he did with the other wise men? It's all based on this this, uh, passage in, in chapter one where Daniel chose God, Yahweh, the God of Israel, and he was obedient to him. And by being obedient to God, God showed favor on Daniel and his friends. And the king witnessed his relationship with God and how it is different in a unique way than any of the other wise men in his court. And because of that, for some reason, the king looks at Daniel and he goes, there's something different about this guy. I'm gonna give him the time that he's asking for. Daniel's decisions and way of living is a proof of God's power and his willingness to give favor to those who are obedient to him. So verse 17, it says, then Daniel went to his house And he told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter. Remember, these are the other three Jews that are with Daniel. Urging them 
to ask the God of the heavens for mercy concerning this mystery of the dream so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of Babylon. I want to pause and sit in the gravity of this moment. Because we know a lot of Bible stories work out okay. A lot of them do, and and we can jump to the end and go, I bet it's going to be okay for Daniel. This. Got it. They worked out in chapter one. Another one? This one? This one? Okay. I, I keep getting directions. I'm going to go with this one. Okay. Daniel's obedience in chapter one is modeled again in chapter two. But in this moment, Daniel and his friends are sitting in their house begging for God to answer because if God does not answer them in a way that only God can, they will die in the morning. Can you imagine the fear, but also the trust in God that in their final moments, potentially their last moments on earth, what they decide to do is to gather together as believers and to pray and beg for God to help them. They're modeling their trust and their faith in God in the midst of what to this day is the scariest moment for them that they've probably ever lived through. Guys, this is a moment to remind us, and we're gonna come back to this again in a little bit, but we are in a season where we have to distance ourselves from people, but we cannot spiritually distance ourselves from our community. Are you with me on that? I know that we have to spend time apart in different ways, but it is important as ever when we are in times of confusion and desperation that we seek to be spiritually close to those people who hold us accountable to what it is that we believe in God's word. Daniel, his first statement in all of this is to seek to pray to God with his friends. Verse 19, it says, the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a vision at night. And Daniel praised the God of the heavens and he declared, may the name of God be praised forever and ever for wisdom and power belong to him. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and establishes kingdoms. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and the hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and light dwells with him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God of my ancestors, because you have given me wisdom and power. Those are those words again, wisdom and power. And now you have let me know what we have asked of you, for you have let us know the king's mystery. In this moment, God, Yahweh, comes through in a way that no other wise men could offer from their own God. Remember, think back to those, it's the truest thing that these sorcerers and and Chaldeans, it's the truest thing they ever said. Our gods aren't with us. Yahweh responds to Daniel, I'm with you. I'm with you in this. I am answering your prayers. I am hearing you. And in that, Daniel responds with this beautiful passage of just praising God for who he is and acknowledging that his is wisdom and his is power and he is the one that brings light into dark places. Daniel puts God at the center of where he draws all of his wisdom and power and strength from. This is an importance of recognizing who God is and how he is moving. And this time Daniel realizes it's not about me. God is doing something here that is amazing and powerful. Verse 24, it says, therefore Daniel went to Arioch, the king's captain, and this is crazy, whom the king had assigned to destroy Daniel and the other wise men of Babylon. He came to him and he said, don't destroy the wise men of Babylon. Bring me before the king and I will give him the interpretation. The confidence that he's coming in with to go, God has answered, take me before the king. I'm gonna answer his question. Also, another characteristic of God that this brings out is that Daniel looks at the captain and says, don't just save me. Don't just save my friends. 
please go to the king and tell him not to kill the wise men of Babylon. Out of generosity of Daniel's own heart, he is using what God has given him as wisdom and power to go forward and to save these men who do not deserve it as an act of paying forward God's generosity and goodness. So Daniel goes before the king. He says, king, I've got the interpretation. The king said in reply to Daniel, whose name for the king was Belshazzar, are you able to tell me the dream I had and its interpretation? This calling out his name again. Remember, this was the given name that the king gave him. Daniel is a name that honors Yahweh, the God of the Jews, God of Israel. This name the king gives him honors a God of theirs, like lowercase g. And so even in this moment, as he's calling him by the name of another false God, Daniel's about to respond for for the God of Israel. Daniel said, no wise man. The king asked him, are you able to tell me the dream that I had and its interpretation? Daniel responds, no wise man. No medium, no magician, no diviner is able to make known the king, make known to the king the mystery that he had asked about. You can imagine the blood boiling in the king. I gave you time. I trusted you. You told me you'd be able to do this. You told me your God was different. And Daniel responds with this, but there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has let King Nebuchadnezzar know what will happen in the last days. But God are two of the most powerful words in all of scripture and all of our time of knowing God. But God comes in a moment where he steps in at the very end of everything that man is capable of and does something so much greater and beyond what we could have imagined. He does the impossible. Daniel continues in verse 30, he says, as for me, this mystery has been revealed to me, not because... I have more wisdom than anyone else who is living, but in order that the interpretation might be made known to the king and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. Daniel says, God has given you this dream and he is using me to interpret it. And so Daniel goes on to start interpreting this dream and we're gonna skip ahead a little bit, but in this dream, there's this massive statue huge statue and the head is made of gold and the shoulders and the arms are made of silver and the torso is made of iron and then it can conti- or bronze and then it continues to work its way down to the legs which are made of iron and down to the feet which are iron mixed with clay and what it's symbolizing is value decreasing down the statue and strength decreasing down the statue and at the, ve- at the very end after this huge statue is erected and the king is watching this in the dream it says that a stone not cut by man's hand, breaks away from a mountain and it rolls down and it strikes the feet and it crushes the entire statue. And it says the statue crumbles in a million pieces and is blown away by the wind till there's nothing left. So in one moment, the king is staring at one of the most beautiful, intimidating images that he's ever seen. And in the next second, this stone comes along and smashes everything beyond it ever being known that it existed. And it says at that moment, that stone grew into a mountain that filled the entire earth. And the king looks at Daniel and you can imagine the king's eyes getting bigger and bigger as Daniel's telling the story because he's going, that's it. That's exactly what I dreamed. That is exactly what I've been seeing in my sleep that's keeping me up at night. What does it mean? Verse 36, Daniel says, that was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. Your majesty... You are the king of kings. The God of heavens has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and glory wherever people live or wild animals or birds of the sky. God has handed all of those things over to you and has made you ruler over all of them. He says, king, you are the head of gold. This is a great place to start. He's looked out at Nebuchadnezzar and said, you're, you're, you're it, man. You are the most powerful. You are the most talented. You are the most high ruling king that this world has ever seen. You are the head, the beginning, the most valuable, the strongest kingdom of gold. And he says, after you, more kingdoms are gonna come that are not gonna be as impressive and are not gonna be as strong, but they will continue along in this timeline of building these different kingdoms. 
But at the end, no matter what happens, this stone is gonna come through and destroy all of the kingdoms that have existed. Verse 44 tells us about this rock that rolls down. It says, in the days of those kings, the God of the heavens will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all of these kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. You saw a stone break off from the mountain without a hand touching it, and it crushed the iron, the bronze, the fired clay, the silver, and the gold. The great king has told the king what will happen. The great God has told the king what will happen in the future. The dream is certain, and its interpretation is reliable, and Daniel drops the mic. Because he says, God has spoken. This is what will happen. Put yourself in that situation real quick. Daniel stood before the king and said, everything that you have built, all of its glory, and arguably King Nebuchadnezzar built one of the greatest kingdoms of all time throughout all of history. Daniel says at the end, it's not gonna matter. It's gonna blow away with the wind. But God will establish something that will last forever. And God has been gracious enough to let you know that ahead of time so that you don't put all of your eggs in one basket. If your own kingdom. Daniel says, wake up. God is getting your attention. He is coming with his kingdom. And that's the one that we need to put our attention into. No matter how great the kingdom, it will fall. And there are great kingdoms, but no kingdom is greater than the kingdom of God. Guys, listen, somewhere around this, we've forgotten that God created us in his image, which makes us this beautiful thing in the eyes of God because he created us to reflect him. And the the amazing things that mankind is capable of should let us look into ourselves and then look back at God and go, God, you are so great because all of the good things that I am capable of are because I am made in your image. But somewhere along the way, we got it backwards and man became the idol of our own image. And we've said, no, it's all the amazing things that I can do and that's my idol, that's what I worship. Look what I can offer. God's going, you got it backwards. No matter how great this thing becomes, my kingdom is what will stand in the end. Knowing something is temporary makes it easier to resist it. If we go on the very basic level of like, I've got this brand new phone coming out, but in two weeks, it's gonna be replaced by an even better phone and they're the same price. Would you wait two weeks to buy the better phone if you knew, right? Right? We would, you'd wait two weeks, same price, better phone. I'm gonna wait, I'm gonna be patient. Let's, let's go another step forward. What about any relationship you've been in and any kind of dating relationship? If you had known how it was going to end, would you have been more patient with how that worked out? Would you maybe chosen a different path? What God is laying before us, he's saying, I'm giving you the gift of telling you what's coming so that you can live your life now according to that. Any time that God's people get too focused on putting their identity on a person, on an object, on a career, on their government, or anything else instead of God, bad things are coming. At this minute, we start wrapping up, and Nebuchadnezzar responds to Daniel, and he, he kills everyone. He doesn't do that. That's what we would expect, right? Daniel just stood before the king, and he said, yeah, everything you've built, it's going to be destroyed. And instead of anger, it says the king responds in this, Nebuchadnezzar fell face down and worshiped Daniel and he gave orders to present an offering of incense to him. And the king said to Daniel, your God is the God of gods, the Lord of kings and the revealer of mysteries since you were able to reveal this mystery. And the king promoted Daniel and he gave him many generous gifts and he made him ruler over an entire province of Babylon. And he made him the chief governor over all of the wise men of Babylon. At Daniel's request, the king appointed Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to manage the province of Babylon, but Daniel remained in the king's court. One quick note as we start wrapping up again, Daniel brings his friends with him because he recognizes how powerful that community is. Guys, the question that I wanna ask is, where do you go for your wisdom? Because that's what this passage is about. The king had all of his wise men and when life became most difficult, their best answers were, I got nothing for you. 
But God, when he turned to Daniel and Daniel turned to God, he brought him a new kind of wisdom that was greater than anything else this world could offer. And so the question I ask us again is where do we turn for our wisdom? Because there are lots of things out there in this world that are offering its wisdom to you, saying that they have the answers and what they offer is better and that the thing that they're bringing to the table is the most valuable. But when we do that, we can take our eyes off of who God is and we, that thing and that wisdom or our own life can become our idol. We have to remember just as Daniel did that when we go to the source and we trust in God, that's where wisdom comes from. Wisdom comes from God, period. And when we stray from that wisdom, life begins to get extremely complicated and messy. The second thing is wisdom is given through obedience. Daniel obeys God and because of his obedience to him and living the life that God has called him to live, God gives Daniel immense favor and wisdom and knowledge. Wisdom is given because he's obedient. And sometimes for us, that's the thing we need to check in our life is maybe I don't have the wisdom that God is offering because I'm not living the life he's called me to live. Wisdom is sought through prayer. Remember, what was Daniel's first response? Uh Uh-oh, I'm in trouble, I'm going to God. His wisdom came from his time speaking to God. Prayer must be essential in our life, day to day. Also, this wisdom is celebrated in praise. Guys, let's not be the spoiled children who receive wisdom from a good God and then go on about our day. One of the most beautiful parts of this passage is Daniel turning back to God and going, you have answered me, you are good. You are more than I deserve. Our praise to God furthers our ability to go back and seek him continually for wisdom. This one we've talked about, wisdom is stronger in community. Please do not isolate yourself during this season or any season of life because the moment you are alone is when you are the most vulnerable. Allow yourself to be surrounded with people in community who are loving God and seeking him and doing their very best to obey his commands so that we together, like Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, and Daniel, pray with one another and seek God for the answers to the very, very difficult things that will come in this world. Wisdom is stronger in community. A couple last things. This is a hard one, so deep breath. If you don't trust God, it's not a God issue. It's a relationship issue. God is who he is, and he is available at all times, and his truth is unchanging and available for everyone. And if we're in a season of life where we're going, God, I just don't believe that what you have is good. It's not because God is not good. It's because our relationship with him is not good. And we are unable to seek ultimate wisdom in a perfect relationship with a God who we don't trust and don't desire to build a relationship with. And we can't just tap into that resource whenever we feel like it and just be like, well, God, I'm not spending any time with you and we're not talking, we're not hanging out, but like answer life's biggest, greatest questions for me. And he might do that in that moment. He might, because he's gracious and he is good and he is forgiving. But how much more powerful and wise will our lives be as modeled after Daniel if each and every day we're doing everything we can to walk in relationship with God? So that we don't have to run back to him when life gets crazy. We're standing beside him going, God, help me. Help me today like you've helped me every other day as we've walked through this life together in this relationship with one another. When I was a kid and I stood on the edge of of a large thing like this, I'm a child and my dad was there to catch me. I was ready to jump because I trusted that he would catch me. But the only way I knew that is because my dad and I had built this relationship where I knew he loved me, he'd care for me, and there's no way that he was gonna let me fall. And that gave me the confidence to stand on the edge no matter how high and leap. And for some of us, we're in a situation where we're being asked to leap and we're not sure that we trust what we're leaping into. God is ready to be the good father that he has promised that he will be and he wants to build that relationship of trust so that you don't hesitate, that when he asks you to leap, you go flying. 
because you believe in the relationship that you have with your Lord and Savior, that he is there to catch you. Let me ask you this last question. Where is it most difficult for you to follow Jesus? Where in your life are you saying the trust just isn't there, God? I don't know if I can give you that. Because let me tell you this, as we read forward in the weeks to come, it's not over for Daniel. Daniel is going to encounter difficult situation after difficult situation, and it's only his obedience and his relationship with God as he trusts him that he's able to navigate these crazy things that are coming down the road. It gets worse for him, but the wisdom never fades. and God's sovereignty never fades and his power never fades in Daniel's life. So let's look and ask ourselves that question. What are we holding back from God? What are we not willing to leap into his arms with? And let's go to him and pray and praise and ask for him to show us how we can overcome that thing with him and with our community. Let's pray. God, you are all of these things that Daniel has claimed that you are. You are wise and you are powerful. You are sovereign above all things. You are in control. And no matter of any kingdom that's been set up or will ever be set up, Lord, your kingdom is the greatest and is the only one that will last into eternity. Father, remind us today as we look into these words that only you are good and that other things can be flattering and shiny and and appeal to us for a little while. They can make us feel good about ourselves for a little while, but only you, Lord, give the peace that lasts into eternity and the hope that lasts into eternity and the love and the joy and the grace and the patience and the kindness, and Lord, the list goes on into eternity. And Father, I pray for my life and for each and every person in this room as we are struggling through what it means to be a Christian and what it means to live here in this world that we seek you each and every day for your wisdom and for your power. And Lord, that we respond in thankfulness because of who you are. Lord, if the only good thing that you ever give me is salvation, it is immensely more than I will ever deserve. And Lord, let me be thankful for the gift that you have given me today. Your son of Jesus, of my Savior, so that I can look forward beyond all of the kingdoms and look into the only kingdom that matters, yours. Father, I lift my heart to you. I am excited to sing out my praise to you in this next moment. It is in your name that we pray, amen. As we finish just singing together, I hope that you can just sit and think through those questions of what is that thing that I'm having trouble trusting God with right now? Being obedient isn't always easy, but it's what Christ calls us to do. And he says that he loves a broken and contrite heart. So when we humble ourselves before the Lord, he is faithful and just. So let's sing about the good news that he offers us.
book of 1 John says, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. We are a people who have hope. 
So we should live like it. Christ is coming, come again our glorious King. Christ is coming, Christ is coming, come again our glorious King. Christ is coming, Christ is coming. Christ is coming, yeah. 
believe it? Yeah. Christ is coming, Christ is coming. Yeah. Come again, our glorious King. Oh, Christ is coming, Christ is coming. Christ is coming, Christ is coming, yeah. Come again, our glorious King, oh. Christ is coming, Christ is coming. Come again, our glorious King. Aaron, if we've never met, I'm one of the pastors here. It's so good to be reminded of why we gather, why we come together and sing and cry out to King Jesus because he alone is worth it. And goodness, just to open his word and, and be refreshed in the truth that wisdom cannot be found in anything that we have but in Christ alone. And so guys, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Thank you for being helpful in this whole process as we try to figure out a new normal for a season in our culture and in our church and we long for the day that will be out there sometime where we don't have to wear our mask and we can hug and high five and shake hands and remember what our mouths look like and what our friends mouths look like and all those things and so just thank you thank you thank you we, we're starting to say that all the time at church but we are so thankful for you guys continuing to be a part and to like help in this whole process as we figure things out and it's so good to be back at Seabury and uh, I know that I was on the TVs last week totally tested negative everything is good there and so yes woo. <laughs> So it's good to be good to be back in person with you guys. Uh, before we get out of here, I do want to say that if you are new to Story Hill, or if you have been a part of Story Hill for a long time uh, and you've never connected with us, we want to know who you are and know your name and know your story because you're worth it and we want to get to know you and, and we feel the value of you being known. And so online on our website at storyhillchurch.com is uh, an online connect form. And you can just fill that out and let us know uh, how we can help. And in that way, you might be thinking, I wanna take a next step in the life of this church. Maybe I wanna get baptized. Maybe I want to start serving. Maybe I want to become a member of Story Hill Church. Whatever that is, we want to walk with you through that process, okay? Now, last week, we announced uh, an update to our relief fund and we made a donation and we're kind of collecting goods for Insight Women's Center. And so I don't know if you noticed on your way in this morning, and you'll certainly notice on, on your way out, but we have a crib, like a pack and play back in the back. There's no babies in it to my knowledge, but we're gonna put a bunch of our stuff in that over the next several weeks. And so we posted it on social media, but you should see on the screens, like here's everything that they need to fill their pantry full of stuff so that they can continue to do ministry in the life of our community. And guys, thank you for your, your generosity. Thank you for your giving. Uh, I know that some of you have asked like, hey, how do I take a step in giving in this church? I wanna financially help the ministry and this kingdom activity. Well, there's so many different ways you can do that. You can give online as a one-time gift or as a recurring gift. You can even Venmo us if you want to. Uh, you can even text to give. And so we've got that information up on the screens, maybe. They'll get to it. Yeah, and so lots of different ways that you can kind of help continue this vision that we have been a part of now going into our third year. And God has been so, so good. So guys, we love you. Thank you so much for coming to church this morning. 
and pausing and remembering why we gather and celebrating. And so we hope that these truths impact you, not just in this moment, but in every part of your life and decisions in the days, weeks, and months, and years moving forward. So we love you. Thank you guys. Have a great Sunday. Bye.